and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, as you uh, find your seats, I'm happy to welcome you to the uh, afternoon session and introduce, introduce our next speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mary Jo Binker. Thank you. Our next speaker and I accidentally sat next to each other at lunch and we discovered we had something in common. We're both very fast eaters. <laughs> we also found that we uh, shared a common passion for history. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Candace Millard to you today. I'm a longtime fan of her work. I think what distinguishes Ca uh, Candace's work from the work of other popular historians is her rare ability to engender suspense despite the reader's foreknowledge of the outcome. I speak from experience. When I read her first book, The River of Doubt, Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey, I spent a lot of time worrying about if and how Teddy Roosevelt was ever gonna get out of that Brazilian jungle, even though I knew that he would. The suspense was worse because I was listening to the book as I was driving the Washington Beltway. So it was always a race to see who was gonna to get to the exit first, Teddy or me. Reading her second book, Destiny of the Republic, a tale of madness, murder, medicine, and the murder of a president, I kept hoping that James A. Garfield would somehow survive the ineptitude of his doctors, even though I knew he wouldn't. I'm well into her latest book, which I have right here, Hero of the Empire, The Boer War, a Daring Escape and the Making of Winston Churchill. And I can tell you that I am already on the edge of my seat, wondering if Winston Churchill is gonna make it out of South Africa alive. If my remarks sound more like a fan letter than a formal introduction, complete with a listing of all of Candace's awards and achievements, of which there are many, that's because it is. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Candace Millard. Thank you very much. Dave, I, is it PowerPoint? Are we, is it PowerPoint? Will we have the PowerPoint? Yes, it's, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that. I assume I sent it earlier, but if not, I can give it without. Uh, let's see if Justin put it on here. Okay. Sorry, C-SPAN. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me just check. Okay. You if go it's ahead not, and then I'll just check with the audio. Okay, uh, all right, yeah. all right, sorry about that. Um, so uh, thank you, first of all, Mary Jo, for that introduction. I really enjoyed our conversation over lunch. Um, I also wanted to say a quick thank you to the International Churchill Society, which um, especially uh, Lee Pollock, who has been such a tremendous help to me, a source of encouragement and incredibly gracious and generous over the past five years while I've been working on this book. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here, very humbling to um, have a chance to meet um, some renowned historians, some of my personal heroes, including, of course, especially um, Sir David Canadine, um, who I was telling him earlier, he's a very difficult act to follow, but I will try my best. As I sat in this room last night, um, having a beautiful dinner, great conversation, I suddenly realized that I, I had been here before, but it was for a very um, different event. Um, it, I was here for a memorial um, for two co-workers uh, from National Geographic, um, just across the street, um, who had been killed um, just a few days earlier on 9-11. They had been on the plane that had been flown um, into the Pentagon. And I remember feeling at the time, as so many people did, that what we needed as a nation, as a world, um, was someone who can not only lead us, but someone who understood history and who understood the power of words and could harness 
those words. What we needed was someone who could stir our hearts. What we needed, in essence, was a Winston Churchill. But as we all know, there was and um, will always be only one Winston Churchill. So as you might imagine, it was incredibly daunting to me years later to attempt to write about him, to understand even a small part of his life. But I have to say, the more I studied him, especially his years in South Africa, the more fascinated I became. And I was hooked. And like so many other writers and historians before and after me, I found him absolutely irresistible. But I think that when most of us think of Winston Churchill, we think of the man during World War II. He has become virtually a synonym for great leadership. He was, as we all know, a master politician, a savior of his country during World War II, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, and one of the most famous human beings in history. But the problem with trying to understand a leader at the height of his career is that we often end up talking about the results of that person's character instead of the forces that created it. What I am trying to understand is where that man came from. What gave him the courage, the insight, and the will to become such a towering figure? So today I'm going to talk about a young man. He's just 24 years old. He has just left the military, the only job he's ever had, the only job for which he's been trained. He has no money. He's already tried to run for office, but lost. He is like so many other children of privilege, then and now, who amount to nothing. So how do we connect this young man to the legend he later became? What made the Winston Churchill we all know? How did he become one of the most powerful and effective leaders mankind has ever produced? I believe that an important part of the answer lies in an exceptional series of events which took place in 1899 when young Winston Churchill went to the Boer War in South Africa. Churchill didn't plan this story, and he couldn't have predicted it, but in every sense, he prepared for it, he understood its significance, he seized control of it, he risked everything to succeed in it, and he turned that opportunity into a life-changing moment that was directly responsible for his later path to power. There is a saying that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And that is exactly what happened here. Churchill was in Africa for only a matter of months. But what happened there put the spark to the combustible mixture of intelligence, ambition, courage, and resourcefulness that defined him from his earliest years. It transformed this young man into a world-famous hero, setting him firmly on the path to greatness. And in doing so, it also transformed the world we live in today. To me, one of the most striking aspects of Churchill's, Churchill's personality, one that sets him apart from the many other young men who believe that they are destined for greatness, who have dreams of glory, is that he did not wait for things to happen to him. He made them happen. He took life by the reins or the collar or the scruff of the neck 
whatever it took, whatever he could grab. In fact, he was so openly ambitious, so incredibly driven, that by the time he was 24 years old, he had already written three books, including his first and only novel, Savrola, run for parliament, and taken part in three different wars on three different continents. Churchill had been fascinated with war from a very early age, but as he grew into a young man, it became more than just the legacy of his ancestor, John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough and one of the greatest generals in British history, more than his 1,500 toy soldiers or the war games that he played at Sandhurst. War for Churchill became the fastest and most reliable route to everything he dreamed of, recognition, fame, and eventually political power. It was, he said, the glittering gateway to distinction. And he was willing not only to fight, but to take any risk to be noticed. He had nearly been killed many times, bullets whistling by his head, once killing the horse that had been standing right next to him. He had killed men himself, once coming so close to his victim that his pistol struck the man as Churchill galloped by. And he had seen his friends not just killed, but mutilated, sliced to ribbons by their enemies. But he did not believe that he himself would die. He wrote that he did not believe the gods would create so potent a being as himself for so prosaic an ending. <laughs> and even with all that he had experienced, Churchill continued to seek out the most brutal battles the British Empire had to offer. He was the first to sign up and the first to show off, however he could. He even, to the astonishment and horror of the men around him, rode a white pony on the battlefield in British India, just to be noticed. He said, given an audience, there is no act too daring or too noble. Without the gallery, things are different. Churchill was impatient to succeed and excel, to make his mark on the world. But no matter what he did, he couldn't get a foothold. The military was too slow for him, so he quit. He ran for his first seat in Parliament, but was rejected by voters. So frustrated and burning with ambition, he feverishly looked for his next opportunity, knowing that it was his destiny to lead. Just a few months later, war broke out in Southern Africa. To the British, this was just another colonial war one that they expected to be over in a matter of months, certainly by Christmas. Unfortunately, they had forgotten who they were fighting. The Boers had been living in Southern Africa for centuries, and in that time, they had transformed from rogue splinter groups of largely Dutch, Huguenot, and German immigrants into an entirely new ethnic group, neither European nor African, but Boer. A journalist for the London Times wrote, in their manner of life, their habits, even in their character, they had undergone a profound change. They had even developed their own language, Afrikaans, which mixes Dutch with everything from French and Portuguese to Khoi Khoi. They were highly religious, unabashedly racist, and stubbornly independent. Most of all, they just wanted to be left alone. In an attempt to get away from the British Empire in 1835, just two years after the British had abolished slavery, they had moved hundreds of miles from the Cape into the African interior in what became known as a Great Trek and established three republics of their own. Their independence, however, had lasted only as long as their poverty. In the mid-1800s, diamonds and then gold were discovered in the Transvaal, one of the Boer republics. 
transforming the region from one of the poorest in the world to one of the wealthiest. Paul Kruger, who would become president of the Transvaal, predicted that this gold will cause our country to be soaked in blood, and he was right. By 1877, Britain had annexed the Transvaal, a move that quickly led to the first Boer War in 1880. Nearly 20 years later, in the fall of 1899, little had changed. The British still wanted the Boers' land, and the Boers still insisted on their independence. The British Empire began amassing troops at the Transvaal borders, and the atmosphere, Churchill wrote, gradually but steadily became tense, charged with electricity, laden with the presage of storm. Finally, the Boers issued an ultimatum, stand down or prepare for war. The British, thrilled to have an excuse to go to war, allowed the deadline for the ultimatum to pass with little more than a sneer. Three days after the war began, Winston Churchill, seeing his opportunity, was on a ship to South Africa, hired to cover the war as a correspondent. On the same ship was Sir Redvers Bowler, Commander-in-Chief of Her Majesty's Army in South Africa. So confident were the British that Bowler would make quick work of the Boers that they had already nicknamed him the Steamroller. But Buller was more cautious when it came to South Africa. He knew the Boers. He had won his Victoria Cross 20 years earlier during the Anglo-Zulu War, in which he had fought not against the Boers, but with them. He knew that, although they did not have an empire, a navy, or even a standing army, the Boers were masters of modern warfare. Unlike most, Britain, uh, most of Britain's colonial enemies, they had incredibly sophisticated weapons, some of which were better than what Buller could give to his own men. They were extraordinary marksmen, having spent the past two centuries doing little else than hunting and fighting. They knew every nook and cranny of the South African felt, and they could disappear without a trace making them an invisible and very dangerous enemy. The Boers had learned from one of their first and fiercest enemies, the Bantu, a large, loosely knit linguistic family with hundreds of different ethnic groups. The, the Bantu included the Kosa, which would be Nelson Mandela's tribe, and the Zulu. The Boers and the Bantu had fought for more than a century. And in that time, the Boers, much like the pioneers of the United States, had done their best not only to take the Bantu's land and subjugate their people, they had learned a new kind of warfare, one that most Europeans did not yet understand. Not only did the Boers know the South African felt inside and out, but whenever there was no place to hide, they made one. They built sangers or small shelters out of piles of stone. They dug deep and incredibly long trenches, some stretching for as many as 30 miles. They didn't wear uniforms, just whatever they wore every day of their lives. And they moved quickly and quietly. Their enemies not only didn't see them coming, they often didn't see them at all, even after the battle had begun. In stark contrast to the Boers, the British had only recently and very reluctantly begun dragging the military into the modern world. In fact, this was known as the Khaki War because it was one of the first times the British Army did not wear their dashing red coats. They hated their new uniforms. They complained that they made them look like bus drivers. But they continued to fight in perfect, precise lines spreading themselves across the flat South African felt like a picture in a storybook served up for slaughter. Even in the midst of a brutal attack, they refused to find cover. British officers in particular were expected not only to be brave, but to show complete disregard for their safety. Solomon Pleike, a native South African intellectual, journalist, and statesman, who had become the first secretary 
of the ANC carefully observed the British Army during the war, marveling at what he saw. These experienced soldiers never care how fast the bullets may whiz about them, he wrote. They stroll about in a heavy volley far more recklessly than we walk through a shower of rain. Although he was now only a journalist himself, Churchill had a lot on his mind as he made his way to South Africa. His mother, the beautiful, charismatic, and wicked smart Jenny Jerome, had just told him that she was in love and was likely going to marry a young man named George Cornwallis West, who was only two weeks older than Winston. Churchill also, for the first time, had his own, his own love life to consider. He had met a dazzling young woman named Pamela Plowden in India. The problem was that he was far from her only admirer. Worse, she didn't believe that he was passionate enough in his devotion. Churchill, of course, was indignant, insisting that he was no fickle gallant capriciously following the fancy of the hour. Even Pamela, however, couldn't compete for Churchill's attention as he neared Cape Town. By the time he landed, the war had already taken a startling turn. The British Army had been humiliated by the Boers, losing several battles, and leaving its commanders stunned and scrambling to adjust to this new kind of warfare. As soon as Churchill arrived, with his valet, of course, as well as a nice selection of wine, a light port, a French vermouth, and 18 bottles of 10-year-old Scotch whiskey, he went as fast and as far as he could to the front, which was now in Ladysmith, just south of Pretoria. By the time he arrived, however, the Boers had completely cut off Ladysmith. No one could get in or out. I was too late, Churchill wrote dismally. The door was shut. So he was forced to make camp 40 miles south of Ladysmith in a little town called Escort. Nine days later, as a heavy rain fell on the morning of November 15th, Churchill climbed aboard the British Army's armored train. His old friend from his days in the military, Almer Halden, had been ordered to take the train out for reconnaissance. Both men knew that it was a foolish, potentially disastrous decision. Not only was the train an easy target on the best of days, but the Boers had been spotted just outside of escort only the day before. Halden had no choice but to go. Churchill, on the other hand, did. But fr frustrated, restless, and he would later admit eager for trouble, he did not hesitate for a moment when Halden invited him to go along. Before the sun came up that morning, Churchill had climbed into the first train car, an open truck from which he would have the best vantage. Behind him, stretching down the tracks, were another armored car filled with men in their khaki uniforms and peaked hats, the engine with its wide-mouthed black funnel and narrow tender, two more armored cars, and finally an ordinary low-sided car that held tools and a few plate layers. As the train cut across the felt, the Boers were silently and invisibly watching, led by a respected and daring young general named Louis Bota, who would later become the first prime minister of South Africa. No man in the Transvaal was more thoroughly Boer than Bota. He could trace his family back to some of the earliest days of European settlement, to the hundreds of Huguenots who left France for Africa in 1685 after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Bota himself had had a quintessentially Boer childhood, one of 13 children on an isolated farm about 100 miles west of Durban. He had received only a couple of years of formal education. But while he would never speak much English, he was fluent not only in Afrikaans, but in Zulu and Soto. He had even fought with the Zulu when he was just 22 years old, 
leading a group of Boers to help Dinizulu defeat his rival for the throne. On the day that Churchill boarded the armored train, Bota and his men were watching as it trundled by, long, loud, blowing a blast of smoke into the air, an absurdly easy target. Not only did Bota know exactly where the train was going, he knew that it would have to come back on the same tracks. As soon as the train passed them, he ordered his men to move to the bottom of a hill and begin piling rocks on the tracks. When the train, on its way back to escort, appeared at the top of the hill, the Boers opened fire, chasing it down the steep slope until it crashed into the stones, catapulting the first two cars off the tracks, killing several men, horribly wounding others, and trapping them all in a hailstone, hailstorm of bullets and shells. Although he was only a journalist, one of the few civilians on the train, and again, 24 years old, Winston Churchill immediately took charge of the defense, shouting orders as he ran back and forth from the engine to the last truck, organizing the men in a desperate attempt to free the train. In the end, he succeeded, and every man who made it out alive credited Winston Churchill's bravery and resourcefulness for saving their lives. Unfortunately, Churchill wasn't there to accept their gratitude or hear their praise. He had been captured and was taken to Pretoria as a prisoner of war. For Churchill, captivity was unbearable, and he would never forget how it felt. Many years later, he wrote, you feel a sense of constant humiliation and being confined to a narrow space, fenced in by railings and wire, watched by armed men. I certainly hated every minute of my captivity more than I have ever hated any other period in my whole life. From the moment he became a prisoner, Churchill resolved to escape. Finally, with two other men, he had a plan. A six and a half foot tall iron paling surrounded their prison, the Stotts Metal School, which was constantly patrolled by guards. When the electric lights came on at night, however, one corner of the yard remained dark. If one of the guards turned his back at just the right moment, they could make their move. After much discussion and careful planning, they chose their night. But when the time came, Churchill's co-conspirators found themselves trapped inside in the glare of the lights and the eyes of the guards. Churchill, who had already scaled the fence, suddenly realized that he was alone, facing the prospect of crossing nearly 300 miles of enemy territory with no map, no compass, no food, no weapon, no ability to speak the language, and with the Boers, who were humiliated and enraged in hot pursuit. What Churchill did have was an absolute faith in his destiny and a clear-eyed understanding that this was the opportunity he had been waiting for. The story of Churchill's escape, escape is an epic adventure by any standard. For those of you who don't know exactly how he survived it, I won't tell you, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> but I will say that by the time it was over, Churchill was not only a free man, he rode back to Pretoria as part of a British regiment, took over the prison, released the men who had been his fellow prisoners, captured the jailers, and watched as a Boer flag was torn down and the British flag hoisted in its place. But more important than the story itself, it was what it meant to Churchill as a person, as a leader, and as an architect of the world we now live in. After he returned home from South Africa, he was what he had always dreamed of being, a hero of the empire.
A famous man now, Churchill ran for parliament again, and this time he won. His life and British politics would never be the same. If Churchill had previously dreamed about the power of his will and his destiny, now he had proof. He was unstoppable. He had not only been part of a great adventure, he had done it alone. He would approach life and politics with an unshakable faith in his own abilities that would not only define his leadership, but provide a foundation of courage and confidence that would inspire entire nations. Churchill would also carry with him the humbling lessons of this experience throughout his life. He understood better than almost any other major leader the enormous cost and tragedy of war. He was extremely compassionate about the plight of prisoners, and he was determined to reach out the hand of friendship to those who had so lately been his enemies. As high as Churchill rose in the political stratosphere, he would never forget his capture, his imprisonment, or his escape from the Boers. As he himself would write, this misfortune, could I have foreseen the future, was to lay the foundations of my later life. Those foundations, in turn, would help to support and shape much of the world we know today. Of course, Churchill didn't know that at the time, but I don't think it would have come as a surprise. Thank you very much. Okay, looks like I have 15 minutes for questions. Yes. So the question is, did the Boers know who they had captured? And the answer is absolutely. So uh, Churchill's father, Lord Randolph Churchill, had been in South Africa just a few years before his death. And he um, had traveled much of the country. And he had written letters um, back home, which were published. He was a correspondent, and which were published in a local newspaper. And in those letters, he had excoriated the Boers. He had, he had um, attacked them for their lack of education, for their lack of sophistication, and for their treatment of, of Native Africans, which was perfectly fair. The Boers knew about those letters, and they hated him. And so when they found out that they had his son, who was also, again, the son of a lord, someone who had been, um, who had been born into the highest ranks of the British aristocracy, represented everything they hated about Great Britain, they were thrilled. And they, were, they made it clear to him that they were going to keep a close eye on him. Um, unfortunately, the Boers were also, well, unfortunately for the Boers, the Boers were also determined to prove to the British that they actually were very sophisticated and they were very civilized. And so this was an officer's prison. And so they went to extreme lengths to let them have all kinds of privileges. So they, I mean, Churchill had a regular barber coming in to cut his hair and give him a shave. He, they had access to newspapers. If you go, you can go to this building where he was kept today. It's, it's a public library. And they, they allowed them to draw a map on the wall of South Africa, charting the course of, of the war. And, um, and so Churchill, of course, as all the men there planned to do, planned to try to take advantage of some of these um, privileges that they had to, to make it easier to escape. Yes. Uh, yes I <coughs> Thank you. I'm very interested indeed in what you've said, and uh, particularly uh, his attitude towards the Boers, because after you know, his famous phrase in victory magnanimity, this is really the first time he demonstrates that. Yes. And of course it leads to this great friendship with General Smuts, who becomes a stalwart ally of Great Britain and indeed its empire. Would you say something about that and how his attitude when he gets back to England develops towards the Boers? 
So he actually got in trouble um, for his um, insistence that he, he believed, like all British did, that the, the war would be over quickly. And of course, it ends up, they think it's going to be a couple of months, and it ends up taking almost three years. Um, but after he um, escapes, after he fights, he begins writing letters saying, you know, we need to begin thinking about when we, of course, other victors coming out of this war, how we're going to help the Boers rebuild. And he really took a lot of flack for that. Um, it was not, as you might imagine, uh, well received, because there wasn't a real understanding of the importance of that at that time, I think. And, um, and when he got back, when he got into parliament, he also talked about the fact that there, was, there were things that he admired about the Boers. He admired the Boer fighters. He admired their ability. And, um, and also got in trouble with that. Um, and he also became good friends, not just with Smuts, but with Louis Bota. And um, as some of you may know, he insisted that not only had Bota been there, been in command of the unit that captured him, but that Bota personally had captured him, had held him at gunpoint and taken him a captive. Um, his Churchill son, Randolph, when he was working on his biography um, realized after doing quite a bit of research, um, and as I think pretty much every historian since then has realized that it wasn't and couldn't have been Bota personally, although Bota was absolutely there and was responsible for the attack, um, but couldn't have been Bota. But, but Churchill, to his dying day, said simply, you're wrong, I'm right, <laughs> it was Bota. And, he, and, and, and Bota himself may have believed it. Um, Churchill talks about a conversation that he had with Bota when he first meets him later on, and Bota introduces himself and he says, you don't recognize me, don't you realize it was me, me personally, it was I, who captured you personally, and, um, and, and Churchill continued to believe that. But it was a great friendship, as was Smuts, and I think that um, it's that kind of sort of reaching across the divide, especially after war, that's so important, and I, I wish every nation could learn from that. Another questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, hand off. Thank you. I would. So Randolph and I were talking um, last night about Jenny Jerome, and um, you know she um, she was a piece of work. <laughs> you know she was a an, a very interesting woman and incredibly beautiful. And I think that unfortunately because of that and because of the relationships that she had, you know after uh, after her husband's death, um, often the the focus is sort of on that instead of on um, the fact that as I said she was incredibly smart, incredibly charismatic, and had incredible energy and vivacity. And, um, and she was hugely important to her son. Um, obviously, his father meant a great deal to him. He had a great deal of admiration for his father. And, you know, Churchill said, you know, he wished that he had been, a, a shop, been born a shopkeeper's son because he would have had an opportunity to get to know his father, and that would have been a joy to him. But he always loved his mother. And as he became a young man and became incredibly interesting and ambitious in his own right, um, she took a great deal of interest in him, and she was critical in helping him in his ambitions. And because she was so involved and because she had so many relationships with men in powerful positions, she was able to help him get military appointments wherever he wanted to go. And he wanted to go everywhere. And this is obviously the height of the British Empire. They were constantly putting down revolts all across the world, from Egypt to Ireland. And so he had his pick with his mother's help of wherever he wanted to go um, to fight. And, um, and during the war, she was still incredibly involved. She um, raised money for a hospital ship, the Maine, that um, went to South Africa to help injured um, British soldiers. And in fact, Randolph and I were talking a few 
haven't, well, if you haven't been to the archives in Cambridge, please find a time to go there. Absolutely incredible. And, um, and I found so many amazing things while I was there. And one of them is a book, a photo album, which belongs to Randolph, um, of pictures showing um, Jenny Jerome, Lady Randolph Churchill, on the main, on her way to South Africa, and her incredibly beautiful suite on that ship, and her beautiful nurse's costume, and, um, and all that she, she achieved. So she was absolutely critical which in Churchill's life personally and to his political ambitions, absolutely. Yes, I'm back there. Yes, absolutely. When he was, when he became Home Secretary, and he says this himself, um, as I said, he absolutely would never, never forget what it felt like to be a prisoner. And even though he was in this very privileged um, prison, he, he hated the idea of being a captive and being enclosed and, and his movements guarded and controlled by anybody um, but himself. And so when he was Home Secretary, he made sure that prisoners, no matter what they had done, no matter how guilty they were of whatever horrendous crime, he believed that they were still human beings and that they deserved access to books, to exercise, to the outside. Um, and so this was absolutely important to him and, and very um, formational in, in that way as well. I agree. Thank you. Yes. A note on treatment of prisoners. He was rather brutal when World War II broke out about enemy aliens, most of whom were deported under fairly poor conditions to Australia. There's a new book about this. I'm just mm -hmm. was that a, a a lapse under crisis? Were uh, was the uh, um, or was the record uh, as um, as largely unblemished as you have just indicated? Well, I, you know, I, I think we can agree. Uh, Winston Churchill was a great man. He was a good man. He was not a perfect man. Um, he was certainly um, an elitist, an imperial, unabashed imperialist. He was a product of the of the the place in which he was born, the time in which he was born. Um, but more specific than that, I think I would be very arrogant and very foolish um, to be, um, to try to comment on. You know, I, I spent five years working on this very small slice of Winston Churchill's life. And um, maybe if I had 20 more years <laughs> um, to look at the entirety of his life, um, I would be better able to, to answer that. But I'm sure there are many, many people who could address that better than I could. Yes, sorry. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, British and Churchill learned a lot of new lessons about a new type of warfare, guerrilla warfare in the Boer War. But when we were talking about the Mediterranean campaign and Churchill's resistance to D-Day, he became very enamored with guerrilla warfare. So while he learned a lot of, in terms of his character and treating prisoners properly, did he perhaps learn the wrong lessons about military strategy in the Boer War? He was still fighting a Victorian war rather than a modern war. The entire British Army learned a great deal during this war. In fact, the, the British Army going into the Boer War was completely different than the one coming out, and it absolutely prepared them for World War I. There was a, a journalist at that time, you know, just a quick side, um, just a, side story about Winston Churchill at that time, as you all know, as we all know, he was an extraordinary, extraordinary writer. And that, as so many of his characteristics, is crystal clear at this point in his life. Even though he was 24, 25 years old, he was, and I read a lot of contemporary accounts of the war by many, many journalists, and I can say absolutely he was head and shoulders above all of them. He was really an extraordinarily uh, precise and insightful and beautiful writer. 
with the one exception of a man named George Warrington Stevens, who actually died during the, the siege. He was, in, he was in Ladysmith. And his, his prose, it's, it's more like poetry. I mean, I could have quoted from him, from him all day long. But he, in particular, wrote about the fact that even just watching it, sort of watching it in real time, you can see the British suffering and confused, and it's this chaos. They're trying to figure out what's going, how it's possible that they're losing what they consider to be a colonial war. And the reason is that they, the war is changing, and they're trying to figure it out. And he says, I think at some point we're going to learn and we're going to get better at this, and they absolutely do. And in fact, they have an overhaul of the British Army after the war. They reassess everything and make dramatic changes. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Candace, I'm sorry. I've got, I've got Catherine over there. OK. They're both so beautiful. I, it's, Candace rearranged her schedule so she could be here for the book signing this afternoon from 4 to 5. Okay, we're about to take our uh, first break of the afternoon, but uh, two quick items of housekeeping. Um, at the end of the last talk of the afternoon, uh, David Locke's talk, I'll give you a briefing on the buses for the State Department uh, for tonight's dinner. Um, our next speaker uh, will begin promptly at uh, 2 o'clock, and that will be Lord Watson. So please reassemble at that time. Thank you.